thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our research. I'm Mary Lake and rhymes with Lincoln. Doesn't look like it from the spelling of my name. Um, <laughs> Um, so I got inspired to do this, to get into this area um, a few years actually after I started my faculty at the Johnson University. Um, and I was aware of the work of Priscilla White. Um, Priscilla White was born in 1900 and graduated from UMass Medical School in 1926, a few years after insulin was discovered. And Elliot Joslin, who was one of the first um, people in the world to have insulin available to treat people with type 1 diabetes, hired her thinking that she was closer in age to the kids who could now be treated with insulin than he and the other two old men who were running the clinic. And um, so kids started to survive, including young women, um, because they could now be taking insulin. And it used to be a death sentence within a few months of, the, of onset of the disease. But what Priscilla White noticed, um, so the first few years of, of particularly taking care of young women who were, when they became pregnant, the changes in metabolism and hormones and everything made uh, the care of the women during pregnancy very challenging, and a high rate of women actually did not survive their pregnancies. So, of course, if the mother didn't survive, then the fetus didn't survive. But by the mid-1930s, she tweaked the control of diabetes well enough that women usually survived their pregnancies, but she noted that about half of the babies were not surviving. So there was a high rate of miscarriage, but what was particularly noteworthy, and she thought was maybe genetically linked to the mother's diabetes, was that there was a high rate of congenital malformations. Now, one of the things that the Joslin Diabetes Center has become most famous for over the last century was the advances in the care of women with diabetes, um, particularly before and during pregnancy, by Priscilla White. And um, so, and she retired in the 1970s. And I thought that it would be really interesting to try to understand at a cellular molecular level how these malformations occur. And even when I started the research, the incidence of malformations were approximately five-fold higher than in non-diabetic pregnancy. Um, and even with advances in, in diabetes care now in the 21st cent century, they're still two to four times higher, and particularly if women don't plan their pregnancies and, and do not get into good glycemic control prior to pregnancy. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background diabetes basics so that you understand some of the um, hormonal and, and uh, metabolism aspects of it. And then talk about how, how research from our lab has worked out how we think maternal diabetes causes birth defects. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't get to see the picture. Sorry, one second. Right, I guess. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Difference. So I'll just uh, go back so you can see Priscilla White. Okay, so that's Priscilla White. Um, okay, so diabetes basics. Um, so this is the GI tract. Um, and when you eat, food goes to the stomach, it gets smashed up, and then it gets broken down into smaller molecules in the small intestine. Now, what's anatomically really interesting ab about the location of the digestive tract relative to the pancreas is that the first organ uh, that um, is supplied with nutrients after a meal is the pancreas which contains the insulin producing beta cells. And so then insulin is released into the bloodstream, those are the triangles, and glucose then is circulating in the blood. And um, at the major insulin target tissues, for example, skeletal muscle and fat, insulin will bind to its uh, receptor, cause translocation of the glucose transporter to the plasma membrane so that glucose can enter the cell, and then glucose is stored for energy and the cell is very happy. Um, now, if there isn't enough insulin produced, for example, in type 1 diabetes, where there's autoimmune destruction of the beta cells that produce insulin, then there can't be any signaling of the insulin receptor, and so glucose can't get into the cells. And in type 2 diabetes, there's malfunction of insulin receptor signaling, so again, the tr uh, glucose transporter doesn't get glucose into the cell. 
So the problem with diabetes, these days people don't usually die, unlike 100 years ago, from hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic episodes, but chronic exposure of tissues to higher than normal glucose levels can cause tissue damage. So for example, uh, cardiovascular disease is the major cause of death in people with, with diabetes. Um, it's actually the major cause of death of everybody, but, um, but people with, with diabetes, in fact, women who have diabetes are, are not protected against cardiovascular disease like uh, non-diabetic women are. But, but both men and women with diabetes have a, a lower, uh, lower age of onset of cardiovascular disease. There's also diabetic retinopathy, which is a major cause of blindness, diabetic nephropathy, which is a major cause of kidney failure. There can also be neuropathy, which causes either numbness or pain of the uh, nerves, particularly in the extremities. And relevant to this talk, diabetic embryopathy. So, uh, so this is the only diabetic complication that does not occur in the person with diabetes, but in the baby of, uh, or embryo. Uh, more particularly uh, of the, the woman with diabetes, is the only diabetic complication that obviously can occur with women with diabetes, not in men. Um, some people don't think it's important because not everybody who has diabetes could be pregnant, even those who are of the right sex are, are not always pregnant. Um, however, the baby only has one chance to undergo normal development. And it, you, there's no going backwards, even if a woman gets her diabetes into good control if they're during the critical stages of organogenesis, if a woman is in poor control of her diabetes, um, there can be a malformation. There's no going backwards. Now, this is actually my first baby. He was so <laughs> little. Um, and I actually started working on this project when I was pregnant, not because I was pregnant. And I'm not diabetic, but I was pregnant when I started working on, on this project. But the point being that what we want is to have healthy babies without uh, structural birth defects because they are a major source of neonatal um, morbidity and mortality. So um, what, when we started this work, we knew that organogenesis is regulated by developmental control genes. And the question that we asked, um, and that I'll be giving a little bit of information about today, is does maternal diabetes disturb expression of genes in embryos leading to malformations? And if so, how does this occur? So I usually present this slide when I give a, a general talk, but I'm going to also give you the backstory. So when I first was thinking about, this was in the early 90s, how do I want to study this? There were a few people studying uh, diabetic embryopathy using rat models, and I wanted to use the mouse because of the availability of mutant strains and engineered strains and, and to look at gene signaling pathways. So it turns out the mouse is a lot harder to control um, if you make them diabetic compared to the rat. Um, and the other thing is that everybody else in the field was usually not doing in vivo experiments. They were usually doing post-implantation embryo cultures, which is limited to a two-day period. But if you incubate rat embryos, yolk sac enclosed embryos, in either high glucose media or diabetic rat serum, you could mimic some of the malformations that occur in human diabetic pregnancy, particularly neural tube defects. And I talked at, 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 you know, in, in depth with you know, a few of these people about setting up a, a, an in vitro uh, system. But there are a couple things that bothered me. One was that the glucose concentrations that they needed to replicate the effects of diabetes were really high, like practically syrup. And even the controlled glucose concentrations were in a diabetic range. And I think that has to do with the rates of glucose uptake and, and diffusion and so forth. So I thought, you know, I, 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 that was a, a concern. That how physiological was it? The other was that, and again, I was pregnant at the time, I thought that a uterus was a better place to incubate an embryo than an incubator tissue culture incubator. None of the other people who were working in the field had a functional uterus. So it, <laughs> <laughs> it maybe just didn't occur to them. So, so what we did was um, we, so we induced diabetes with a drug, streptozytosin, that destroys the beta cells of the pancreas. And the mice got hyperglycemic. In fact, they got really hyperglycemic around the time of implantation. And at first, what we found was that there's a high rate of um, it, um, malabsorption or, you know, we couldn't recover embryos that were malformed because they had been reabsorbed already. And we, I actually found out um, 
after I came back from maternity leave, oh, with the first baby, um, about these insulin pellets that were being made in Canada for experimental use. And so what we do is we induce diabetes, but then about a week after the mice are hyperglycemic, we implant these insulin pellets that constitutively release insulin, and then they get into good control prior to pregnancy. Then we mate them along with um, age-matched uh, uh, controls. And there's, um, so it turns out pregnancy is a, a naturally insulin resistant state. So, that, and this is physiologically normal so that you can drive more nutrients to the fetal placental unit. And being a reproductive endocrinologist, I anticipated that this might occur. And so, lo and behold, the mice became more hyperglycemic um, around the time of implantation, but not so severely as they had been without the insulin pellets. And so normal mice would be able to produce more insulin. There's hypertrophy as well as hyperplasia in normal pregnancy, but because the diabetic mice were only dependent on the insulin pellets, it, they weren't able to produce more insulin with pregnancy. So it, it made a, a nice, um, not severely, severely hyperglycemic environment, but poorly controlled diabetic environment. And what we routinely do is we we sacrifice the mice and recover embryos on day 7.5 to look at biochemical <coughs> markers. So day 7.5 turns out to be in the mouse the day that is that the embryos are susceptible to neural tube and cardiac defects. And on day 8.5 to look at changes in gene expression or day 10.5 to score for defects. And just as a reminder, these days of mouse gestations, day 7.5 to 10.5, correspond to weeks four to five of human pregnancy uh, dated by last menstrual period. So about the time a woman is recognizing that she's becoming pregnant. So when we first now had a successful system, if we recovered embryos on day 10.5, an embryo of a non-diabetic mouse had a closed neural tube, whereas we saw a high rate of exencephaly and spina bifida in embryos of diabetic mice. And this particular malformation looks a lot like what you see in a mouse strain called splotch that has mutations in uh, the gene PAX3, which is expressed in the neural tube. And homozygous splotch embryos develop neural tube defects with 100% penetrance. So we thought that, that if we, there was reduced expression of PAX3, that would be sufficient to cause a neural tube defect. So when we looked by in situ hybridization on day 8.5 when PAX3 comes on, we saw that compared to an embryo of a non-diabetic mouse is looking down at the dorsal surface of the head folds, um, there was significantly reduced expression of PAX3 in embryos of diabetic mice, and we also see this by real-time RT-PCR. So the sort of a, a flow then of, of how we think um, the neural tube defects occur is that there's something about the adverse environment of maternal diabetes that inhibits expression of PAX3, maybe failure to assemble uh, chromatin properly or transcription factors. So if you don't have enough PAX3 transcription, you don't have enough PAX3 protein. And although I won't be going into detail, one of the things that we've found is that PAX3, although it is a transcription factor, independent of transcription, it binds to the P53 tumor suppressor protein and stimulates its degradation by MD, uh, MDM2 mediated ubiquitination and degradation. This then leads to increased apoptosis in the neural folds, which then leads to a neural tube defect. So what I'm going to be talking mostly about is how does maternal diabetes inhibit expression of PAX3? Well, um, so we, oops, sorry, we showed that in fact it is high glucose. Um, from the mother. It's necessary and sufficient to inhibit expression of PAX3 and to cause neural tube defects. Um, interestingly, the embryo expresses the GLUT2 glucose transporter, which is a high KM glucose transporter. It's also expressed on pancreatic beta cells in the liver, but ha being a high KM transporter means it doesn't work very well at normal glucose levels, but during episodes of maternal hyperglycemia, it makes the embryos like a glucose sponge. And in fact, embryos do need to express uh, wild type copies of, of two wild type copies of GLUT2 in order to be susceptible to uh, maternal diabetes induced malformations. Now, something also that I no noticed was sort of interesting is that the embryo is physiological or hypoxic. Okay. Um, and so the embryo, oxygen is diffusion limited um, as far as delivery on uh, day 7.5. That actually stimulates um, yolk, uh, blood island formation on the yolk sac. So one of the things that we've shown, I'm going to talk fast and go through this really quickly, but um, so glucose exposure actually causes a more severe hypoxia in the embryo. This then induces a superoxide production, and we can replicate the effects of high glucose or low oxygen with a drug antimycin A, which also stimulates superoxide production. That's then broken down to hydrogen peroxide, or converted to hydrogen peroxide, which if you don't have enough gl reduced glutathione, which is also 
a source of oxidative stress. Um, you don't get breakdown to water. And in fact, we can block the effects of high glucose, low oxygen, or antamycin A with additional reduced glutathione or with additional vitamin E. And so something that we've shown recently is that the uh, mechanism by which, or one of the mechanisms, sorry, uh, <laughs> by which high glucose or an oxidative stress inhibits expression of PAX3 is it's known that, the, or we, we showed actually that, so many developmental control genes are inhibited um, by hypermethylation before their onset of expression. And we showed that in fact PAX3 is hypermethylated before it gets turned on. And then during normal development, there's decreased expression of the DNA methyltransferase 3B. That then hype leads to hypomethylation of PAX3, and this is necessary for activation of its expression. Um, but with oxidative stress, there seems to be increased DNMT3B activity, which maintains a high level of methylation of the PAX3 CPG island, and that's part of the mechanism by which PAX3 expression is inhibited. Um, so then back to you know, our pathway, oxidative stress stimulates DNMT3B, which leads to inhibition of PAX3 expression. And I'm not going to talk about some of the work that we've done with stem cells. But in conclusion, genes that uh, control essential developmental processes, such as PAX3, we think are regulated during normal development by fuel metabolism, so that excessive glucose metabolism disturbs the signals for activation of these developmental control genes. So I just wanted to say that that little baby that was I showed earlier on, he was joined um, two and five years later by little brothers. And they, they, they have grown up very nicely. I'm growing down, they're growing up. And that little baby graduated from college just last Friday from University of Southern California. <laughs> And I'd like to thank uh, most of the fellows and students um, who did the research. Um, and Green, our collaborators and funding agencies. So thank you.